Because one drop of his blood <laughs> is more powerful than bacteria and virus. Because there is enough healing just in the hem of his garment. We yet are alive. Because we have been taught to give. We have found out that we've never been without. And I wonder today, are there any assembled believers that, oh God, I thank you just for being God. I wonder if there's anybody that when you look back over your life, you can testify that if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, that you would not be here. Well, I'm going to be, going to be quite honest. I don't know how service is going to end. Amen. Y'all done stole all of the luster of the service. Amen. But all is well. We give honor to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, who is and who will always be. We honor our bishop, amen, her grace, Bishop M.S. Nesbitt. And all of those of the ecclesia that fall up under her leadership, we bless you and we celebrate you to our visiting pastor and her congregation. Amen. God bless you. Amen. To my beautiful wife. Amen. God bless you. Amen. To all of you in your respective places. Amen. Happy New Year and God bless you, you, and you. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Just for a moment. Amen. It's those moments where, as a preacher, I wish I could carry a tune. That's all I can do is carry it. Now, where are we going to go with it? I don't know. Amen. Amen. I, no, no, no. I've been preaching long enough not to fall for that. I got your trick. Amen. <laughs> amen listen we have been talking since amen yesterday from the book of nehemiah amen it is uh, pressed upon our bishop's heart amen that we understand the content and the context of nehemiah's writing and so we want to honor amen the instructions of god passed on to us amen and I want to come today briefly as the Lord would allow from Nehemiah chapter 4. Go there with me quickly. Amen. We don't plan to be before you, amen, too long, but we plan not to leave you until God leaves us. Amen. Amen. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, I'm going to read one verse real quickly. From the King James Version, you'll find these words recorded in the Holy Writ of God, the sixth verse of the fourth chapter of Nehemiah. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. This is the word of the Lord. Bless you. Read it, here and keep it saying sacred. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we pause just for a moment just to say thank you. God, for your goodness and for your mercy. We ask now, God, that you would take this, your servant, O Lord, and use me for your glory. Hide me behind thy sacred cross that no my, nobody sees me, hears me, or understands me, but they hear, see, and understand you, that you might get praise, that you might give glory unto your people. Manifest yourself in our midst, and we will celebrate your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk, amen, just for a few moments from the subject entitled as we embark upon the direction and the course of journey for 2023. And I want to start this sermon off with this declaration that this is the year of the church's revival. This is the year 
of the church's revival. Part of the insight of Nehemiah's writing is that um, it begins or that the beginning of success is that we must first develop in our mindset that success is possible and it is achievable. Success must be um, the course of completion from the development of one's thought in the mind to the completion of the manifestation uh, process in which you now deliver back unto God that which he birthed in your mind. The mindset of a builder is discussed here in the writings of Nehemiah in that a builder must understand that one must be determined to complete the task set before them even in the presentation of great opposition and adversity. If some of us tell the whole truth, last year was only a struggle at points and times within that year because we got a quitter's mentality that soon as things got a little hard, soon as things got a little rough, we reclused ourselves and went into hiding and isolation. And when people questioned our whereabouts, we religiously fabricated and said, the Lord knows my heart. Uh, we are in a position now where um, the church as we know it is in opposition on how we conduct ourselves as related to religious gatherings and ceremonies. Um, here we are still lingering in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of a undocumented and untested uh, flu season, and yet we are still in masks. We are still trying our best to practice safety precautions, checking temperatures, and we have adjusted and readjusted our position in a society that no longer abides by the question or abides by the cautions that they put us under. You go into the world, you don't see people wearing masks. You go into society, people are not social distancing. You go to public places, there is no more a mandate to be covered up, to be distant, to wash your hands. But yet, the church has the mandate to still follow precautionary measures. And yet, we are behind masks. We are still checking temperatures. And the problem is, is not that we are taking caution. The problem is, is that many people have developed a mindset that if I got to go through all of that, whoop, I may as well not even go to church at all. Uh, and we have gotten so accustomed to be able uh, to put on a, a TV show and to click on a website and think that we're going to get the same result uh, as if we were in the house. Woo! Uh, but I stopped by to announce in 2023 uh, that even if we have to stay in a mass, uh, even if we have to social distance, uh, even if we have to still check temperature, uh, I'm here to announce that this is the year that the church rises up from a dead place uh, and lives out in a revival amongst the land. Can I get an amen? Here, when we begin to search the text, we understand uh, that no builder can achieve anything by themselves. Uh, uh, we have to share uh, uh, this eisegetic mentality uh, wherein we think that we are the end all, the be all, uh, that it cannot happen without you. Uh, but Nehemiah teaches us uh, that in order to accomplish anything great uh, for our God, uh, we got to first establish the right team uh, of support around us. Uh, we ought to understand uh, that the challenge of establishing a team uh, is that when you get more than three folk together, uh, there becomes a disagreement as to who is the leader of the pack. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, it's not about you. 
it has to become uh, in our mindset that the work is more important than the people. Uh, woo! You got to develop the military men's side mindset that says that it is always about the mission first. Uh, it is not to degrade the value of people, but it is to announce that no matter who's with you or who's against you, uh, there is a task that needs to be performed and if we're going to achieve anything we cannot be called up in the political atmosphere of who's in charge but we got to understand that you can't be in charge if all you see is the problem <laughs> Nehemiah in the development of the process of building a wall he begins to announce that around him uh, there are people in the camp uh, that want to be a part of the work uh, but all they see uh, is the problem that exists in the land. Uh, all they talk about uh, is the distress and the decay of the land. Uh, all they announce is the ruins of a burnt down wall. Uh, but when you have the Holy Ghost uh, rooted on the inside uh, God will cause you uh, to see things differently. Uh, the qualifications of a leader uh, is to be able to see beyond uh, what others see. Uh, to understand more uh, than what others understand. Uh, while everybody else announced decay uh, Nehemiah said I see a wall uh, being built up. I see the city uh, being refortified. I see the kingdom of God uh, like never before. Uh, look at your neighbor and say what do you see this year when we begin to assess the text I am one to believe that this year will expose doors of opportunities that require effective work this is the year that we have to move beyond verbalizing church and our actions must begin to speak louder than our words i hear you say you love god but does your labor match your verbiage i hear you say you a giver but does the testimony match your verbiage it's time now to put up our y'all said it not me I grew up old school. We couldn't use that kind of language in public. <laughs> the reality is that everybody that is around you is not fit to be on your team. But it is a requirement to understand that everybody that wants to attach themselves to you, you have a responsibility to educate them on the value of being a team player. Nehemiah chapter 8 gives us understanding of the discourse of things that happened after the wall was built. But before you get to chapter 8, you got to understand that before, between chapter 4 and chapter 7, you got to understand that those who are visionaries, you cannot announce a vision without acknowledging the opposition that the vision will attract. The problem with the church today is that we don't want to struggle. <laughs> we don't want to fight no more. We don't want to stand with tenacity anymore. We have, we have separated and widened the, breadth, the gap between the generations. But I'm here to announce in 2023 that God is calling for every generation to strengthen their hands to the gospel plow. Because I've called the old, said the Lord, because they know the way. And I've called the young because they are strong. I stopped by to let somebody know that this is the year of the church's revival. No, we may not ever go back to 20 services a month. But when we do come here, it ought to be some healing. 
when we do show up, it ought to be some deliverance. You got to understand that real work is not in how many services you have, but the real work is in the quality of the service you're in. Can I get a witness here? It does not matter if you come day in and day out, if folks still live the same. But is there anybody here that could test all I need is one good service to change my mind. All I need is one good service to light the fire. All I need is one good praise to deliver my household. Shout yes. It is. Nehemiah's writing that tells us that the builder has the responsibility of effectively communicating the process from destruction to construction. The problem that has existed in the church worldwide is that we have mandated and asked people to do things ignorantly. We have not explained the process. We have not communicated the how. We have gotten too offended when somebody questions the process. But when I read the text, Nehemiah says, the way you deal with a challenge of how is to tell them that the hand of my God, which was good, is still on me. It might not look right. But can you see his hand? It might not sound right, but can you see his hand? It might not be the way you think it ought to be, but can you still see the hand of God? This year, the church universal must decide that I'm going to have a builder's mentality. If I am to revive the church, well, what is the builder's mentality? It is one who lives and operates and serves with purpose. Now, the difference is, can I teach just for a moment? Don't mean to bore you, but I need to educate you. In church, we must Understand the difference between living with purpose versus operating with intent. Lord, have mercy. Whew. See, when you live in purpose, you are more concerned about the completion of the work. And when you live with purpose, you're no longer uh, focused on personality conflict and difference when you have purpose as your agenda you are no longer concerned about who disrespected you 20 years ago and now you are trying to be the champion saint to bring everybody together for the same purpose the problem is is that many of people in the church are not living with purpose we're living with intent we do things because we intend to be promoted. We do things because we intend on being recognized. Woo! Oh my God. We do things with the intent of becoming the teacher's pet. Becoming the one that the bishop likes. Uh, we do things with the intent to show off our robes and our outfits. To show off how we shout. And how we speak in tongues. And how we can lead people into a charismatic wave of praise. But I stop by to announce that all of that has its place. But it's just a form of godliness. But it denies the power therein. But those that want to revive the church ought to start looking at one another. And say I can't make it without you. And you can't make it without me. Let's just stay together.
Nehemiah teaches us that the purpose of a builder is not selfish. His whole agenda of reviving the church and rebuilding the wall was not for promotion of self, but to establish a place where God could gather the remnant of those who had been scattered because of opposition and captivity. If the church is going to revive itself, you have to start looking out for the best interest of somebody outside of yourself. When you come to church, it has to be for more than a purpose of you shouting and you getting delivered. But you ought to come to God's house with the mindset that I'm going to pray until my neighbor's life get better. I'm going to shout until my neighbor's situation changes. Because the real revival of the church is to provide a place where those who have been scattered because of the attack of the enemy, that they can come back and find refuge and peace and tranquility. Stop trying to get your resume built. They not coming because you lay hands, but they're coming because the book has been opened. Stop promoting yourself. It's not your singing. It's because the book has been opened. Stop promoting yourself. It's not your charismatic ways. It's because the book has been opened. And if we focus on the book, more than we focus on ourselves, then the Bible says that there will be a praise. There will be a celebration that has become unmatched like never before. The Bible says that when the wall had been built and when the priest had opened the book and when the minister stood on the platform, and when Ezra began to bless his name, the church went up in a praise. And the testimony was that the church hadn't shouted like that since they came out of Egypt. Look at somebody and say, I need a revival. So... I need, I need a couple of preachers to run up here. If you don't have a run, trot. If you lost your trot, walk fast. I need some on my right. And I need some on my left. I need some deacons and some deaconess to come at the altar and face the congregation. I need, I need some saints to stand up wherever you are. And I need somebody to testify. Say, I got a mind to work this year. I got a mind to serve the Lord. I got a mind to give him glory I got a mind to build the church back from the dust to his former glory I got a mind to work together to pray together to shout together now the Bible says the Bible says that after the priest read the text he looked at the folk and said to the people, listen good. You've cried your last tear last year. You are here this year because the Lord 
has brought you. You're here this year because the Lord has kept you. And when you think about where you used to be and think about where you are right now, the Bible says that Ezra didn't ask them no questions. This is the year that we talk less and do more. The Bible says that Ezra, when the house was reestablished, when water was put back in place, the Bible says that they read the law again and said we have to cut out excuses. Uh -huh. He said, folks said, I can't get to church. It's too far. They said, go get branches from the olive trees and build temporary hotels in the church parking lot. And while we are in service, I don't need you to leave. Don't you leave church in your mind. Your pinto beans and black eyed peas will be all right. Your ham hock will be all right. Your collard greens will be all right. But what he said is that while the church is a simple, See, y'all ain't read the text. The text says, Ezra assembled priests on his left and on his right. And Ezra surveyed who was around. And he instructed the deacons, the Levites, whoo, that says, if I said anything over people's head, you go to them and clarify simplify it till they understand what has been said from the podium. But the text says that when Ezra praised God, it was a domino effect. And the problem with the church is that we have lost the respect for God because those that are supposed to communicate God have become spectators themselves. If the preachers will get back to praying, if the preachers will get back to dancing, if the preachers will get back to shouting, then the congregation will understand that God is worthy to be praised. I got to go. My time is up. I got black oak. I got some black eyed peas cooking in the crock pot. Woo! But the Bible says we've already announced the church's revival. We've already dealt with last year's issues. He says, so get your stuff together. Grab your bags and your purses. Go home and eat. But while you are getting out of here, understand this, that God must be praised. If, if the church is going to remain successful, we got to open the book again. Stop offering all these unsolicited opinions about what you think. And hey, why don't you open a book and communicate what you're supposed to know? Woo. If we get back to the book, the church's power will come back in the building. How many of this year ready to see new cancer Woo. being healed? How many of you ready for new cases of diabetes to be healed? How many of you ready to testify that God has done something new in 2023? I believe it's in your praise. Because when praises go up, 
blessings come down. If you need a kidney, praise him. If you need a healing, praise him. If you need a deliverance, praise him. Let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath, praise, praise, praise him until it changes. Praise him until your house is saved. Praise him. 20. 23 the year of the church's revival no we might not go back to how it used to be and that's the goal the goal is to go forward to how God wants it to be I don't need a bunch of church services I just need him to move when I show up because where two or three are gathered together there shall I be in the mess. Look at somebody say, did you bring the Lord with you? Praise him. Until your neighbors testify that God brought about a change. In the word of God, I got a hiding place. In the word of God, I got a hiding place. In the word of God, I've got a hiding place. Shout yes, shout yes, shout yes. Whatever you need today, God's got it. You got to believe what's written in the book. If you need healing, I dare you to run across this aisle. If you need a deliverance, I dare you to trot across this altar. According to your faith, be healed. According to your faith, be delivered. According to your faith, be set free, shout yes. Whatever you need, just open the book. Whatever you desire, open the book. It's in there, it's in there. Shout yes, shout yes. Healing, it is your portion. Prosperity, it is your portion. Good health, it is your portion. Joy is your destiny. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You're stronger this year. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You're wiser this year. Shout it! Somebody shout revival, revival. Revival, revival. He's doing it again. He's doing it again. The glory is falling. The glory is coming. He's doing it again. He is reviving the power of the church, the value of the church.
This is our year. Shout it! Yeah. Everyone standing. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm hungry now and I got to go. But say, neighbor, on my way out, take this praise. This praise is for you and your household. I decree. And I declare that this is your year of holistic revival. Look at somebody and say, take this home with you. You're better. Take this home with you. You're healed. Take this home with you. You are delivered and you are saved. You and your whole household. Now I want to him that is able to keep us from falling, present us falling before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power forever and ever and ever.